Hello and welcome to It's About Youth, the show that talks about issues that matter to youth ahead of GE15. I'm Fanashe. Now, the world has shifted over uh, after COVID-19 and so too are politics and governance when it comes to healthcare. Given the increased awareness of the importance of healthcare, um, the various coalitions, uh, you know, party coalitions ahead of G15 will probably have specific policies, uh, healthcare policies that they will focus on. So we want to know what they are or rather what they should be. So with me today is two healthcare representatives. One, uh, Amirul Amza from Medical Mythbusters Malaysia, an NGO fighting fake medical information out there. The next is Sean Tam the Policy Officer for the Malaysian Health Coalition. Thank you so much for joining me, you two. Thank you for inviting me. All right, awesome. Yes. So before we start talking about policies and healthcare reforms, we would first like to know, you know the overview of healthcare policies or healthcare um, system in Malaysia. So first and foremost, I would like to ask both of you, what are the current healthcare challenges, especially those that we are made aware of post-COVID-19? It has been a hard couple of years and a lot of issues has been exacerbated because of COVID-19. But, you know, we are living now in a world where healthcare is more important than ever. But there's still a lot of challenges that we encounter. So, Sean, if you could go first, what are the current healthcare challenges you feel? Thank you, Farhana. Uh, well, this is a great question. Over the years, we have been hearing a lot of um, concerns that there are actually not enough healthcare workers in the country to actually serve the population. And, and this is actually... Um, an issue because um, our population is growing year by year and our however our um, number of our healthcare workers who are you know the nurses doctors dentists uh, pharmacies um, may not be increasing uh, in terms of number of positions uh, as the population is increasing so this is number one uh, a very uh, major issue for our country a major challenge for our country and secondly um, in terms of in, uh, institutions and infrastructure and facilities um, we have got a lot of uh, great places you no know, great hospitals and mm. clinic kesihatan however some of them are actually uh, quite um, quite aged yeah a bit and outdated a bit yeah. run down yeah. a bit yeah, yeah. and um, um, we do require a bit of um, touching up on their uh, f these facilities and infrastructures mm -hmm. uh, to in order to provide uh, no, a 21st century uh, work class healthcare mm. for our people. Yeah. What about you, Amira? What do you think are the major current health challenges right now? Right. I think what Sean has celebrated is more on the resources part. Actually, the resource part is what Sean has thought is about internal resources, which mm. is the healthcare system and also the facilities. But we should also see the external part, which is the access yeah. to its, the healthcare system itself. Mm -hmm. You see, during the pandemic, there's a lot of lockdown. So when lockdown happened, a lot of people who usually go to hospitals for their normal follow-ups, for their surgeries that has been postponed so many times during the pandemic, but because of the lockdown, they have problem with access to healthcare. If, let's say, we do some reform in the healthcare that we have access even to the rural area, focusing on the needs of the people that is quite marginalised, that will be a better uh, better things in the future lah. because access to healthcare is not only a challenge in Malaysia but also in uh, countries out there even in developed countries mm -hmm. so access is one thing we should see so there's an internal problem and there's also an external mm -hmm. problem here so let's pick up a few issues here when it comes to healthcare challenges right for discussion purposes first and foremost I would like to ask Sean um, COVID-19 the fight is still not over um, there's a recurring pattern of new variants here with cases going up and down, up and down. So how do you think the government has dealt with this? And, and is there any areas of improvement, especially moving forward now that we need to have, you know, sort of a contingency plan if this thing doesn't stop? Right. Uh, thank you, Farhana. Well, first, we need to give credit where it's due. Yeah, and we need to definitely. acknowledge that the government, the Malaysian government has actually been um, quite good in terms of uh, our management of COVID-19. Yes. From the beginning, we took really decisive measures. Uh, we came out with MCO early um, and we managed to make sure that the number of cases did not um, go, no, uh, did not overwhelm our healthcare system and yeah. it allowed us to buy time. Then secondly, we were able to actually procure vaccines and distribute mm -hmm. it uh, efficiently. Our, social, our uh, communication and messaging were good enough to the point that we were able to let uh, the majority of Malaysians to get vaccinated and secondly boosted yeah. and this is good these are good stuff however however um, um, despite the initial success I think we have consciously or otherwise um, seen a shift in terms of our approach from um, prevent death first to um, recovering the economy first mm -hmm. 
and there are a lot of um, policies such as say reducing the social uh, distancing uh, policies, removing the mask mandates, um, and, and and these are these are policies that may actually um, cause us to see a rise in cases. Um, so, like as you mentioned, Fahana, there has been a lot of different variants, and now over, over now we are seeing the, an increase in number of cases, especially with the XBB uh, sub Omicron uh, sub lineage uh, yeah. XBB variant, which actually has been pushing our numbers to um, about. Um, seven day average yeah. to about 4,000. Yeah. So this is something that we can do, especially as we are approaching the election season, mm -hmm. where we are going to be mega chiramas, there are going to yeah. be people canvassing votes uh, in the pasta, in the, yep. you know, mm. in the marketplaces. So messaging wise, yes. there needs to be sort of messaging for the people who actually will go out campaigning, yeah. people who join you know, all this procession to yeah. probably you know, protect themselves. Yeah. Um, and this is actually a good time, I mean, uh, thanks Astro uh, for inviting <laughs> us, uh, for us to actually utilise um, number one social media, for the people to have you know, True. to True. limit uh, the exposure, and also um, perhaps uh, the government can actually allow uh, each candidate you know, free time to actually express their views because this will uh, you know pre uh, stop them from actually meeting face to face yep. and, yeah. and spread the virus. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. True. So that's on COVID-19. So let's focus more specific to youth now. Mm -hmm. um, the anti-smoking bill that is supposed to ban smoking and tobacco right. for the next generation to come, right? So it has, obviously it's, it's, it's a very good idea, it's a very good initiative by the government and but it has met with certain, opposi uh, mm -hmm. certain opposition to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how feasible is it when it comes to implementation and what challenges can we expect? Especially, you know, that there's probably going to be a shift to a new government who might have to adopt this. Right, right, so right. what do you think, Amiro? I think because generally what we call the generational ban or what we call SGEG, I'm just mm. going to call it by names, okay now. Yeah. It's a good move and it's a WHO mandated move because we need to know that Malaysia is a signatory nation under FCTC Framework Convention of Tobacco Control that we have signed and we have pledged our um, promise that we are going to fight as much as we can to go away from tobacco to get this what we call end game. Okay. And this WHO framework, they have a substan substantial focus empower we call them and for the p in power is to protecting the future generation from exposes exposing themselves to tobacco so what this generational ban will do is they will prevent those who are born after first january of 2007 yeah. from getting involved with not only tobacco smoke but also the vape which is also considered as a smoking products now we are starting to see that a lot of injuries from vaping mm. even mechanical injuries from blowing up the uh, blow up device blown up device and also what we call e-valley e-cigarettes and vaping associated lung injury yeah. which is a case related directly to vape and e-cigarettes we don't want this to become a burden to our healthcare so instead of focusing only on the tobacco we must also focus on the generational ban of vape and e-cigarettes mm. as well however i noticed that there are some um, individuals and some groups that are op that are opposing the involvement of vapes in this um, ban because of some uh, some they would say that it is economical issue mm. because they say is this is perniagaan yeah, certain kaum brings, brings, brings money yeah. to them and all that but you need to remember that similar with tobacco the tax that we put on tobacco product will never ever compensate for the healthcare costs. It yeah. will be the same with vape. That is why we need to involve the, uh, include the vape and e-cigarettes into the generational ban. Yes. And whoever wins the election, I would really love to see that they continue with mm. this current plan of generational ban. So an improvement would be to not only focus on smoking ban, but to push for vaping and e-cigarette as well. Right to be in the conversation, to push for it as well, right? Yes. Okay, so we've talked about COVID-19, we talked about um, GEG. Now we looked at, you know, one of the issues that is of importance, especially among youth, which is, you know, we have seen a rise of suicide cases and depression and mental health issues, especially among teenagers, among adults, young adults who have been greatly impacted by COVID-19, not just, you know, with loneliness, but not being able to find a job, not being able to, to see friends. So definitely COVID-19 exacerbated a lot of mental health issues in Malaysia. So the importance of mental health, especially for youth, 
and is there enough investment on it? Again, areas of improvement. Um, Sean? Yes, Fahana. Um, well, in terms of investment, there can always be not enough investment. Yeah, we definitely. can always yes. be putting yes. more investment, more. right? Uh, but about for especially for youth, I think there are three things that we can focus on. The first thing is actually to increase uh, awareness. Uh, people must know, people must be able to you know, identify um, what are the symptoms. Um, you know, because COVID-19 has actually brought us uh, an increase in terms of numbers of people uh, exhibiting symptoms of depression, anxiety, and even stress. So people must be able to number one identify that you know this are, this is actually a symptom and this is actually affecting my life and actually I need to have help. I need oh. to seek help. And secondly, conversations must be normalized because a lot of people are afraid of um, speaking about their sy symptoms or actually reaching out for help because um, it may be a taboo in their community or it may be a sign of weakness. Um, to to the people they are they hang around with, so uh, we must be able to actually make conversation uh, something that's normal, and people will be able to so that people will be able to you know, be more open to actually seeking for help. Yeah. And third thing, um, we have to we have to uh, our messaging has to be our communication messaging has to be clear, uh, so that people know actually where and how to seek help. Yes. So um, there are a lot of. Um, resources available online nowadays because it's, we're thankful that we're in this era where we can actually get... Just Google uh, it. Yeah, you can just Google it and find everything call. online. Yeah. Um, so, um, so it would be a great, it would be great if, we can, if we can actually you know, raise awareness, uh, normalise conversation and also uh, make sure that everyone has a clear and uh, correct uh, information. information. Yes. Amira, what about you? What do you think about you know, the support that people, or people suffering or young adults who are suffering mm -hmm. with mental health mm -hmm. Right now, do they have enough support right now in terms of dealing with what they're dealing with? I'm not sure to say about support, but I agree with Sean. Basically, they need to know that they are in problem right now. They oh. are having a problems right now. Uh, the problem is one like Sean said is actually they don't. They are not aware. Number two is actually even if they are aware, they are worried about the stigma. Mm. So this come to my point here is actually they are having access freely to social media, and in social media you can get anything, any information very easily and this makes them prone to misinformation mm. right so talking about misinformation you know because our main social media are third party platforms that is not really governed by any rules mm. or regulation in our country except for some regulations by the mcmc uh, this will be very difficult to handle if let's say there is no policies mediating the government to control the spread of yes. misinformation mm -hmm. cyberbullying and also usage of social media for anything that is harmful for example mm -hmm. selling um, uh, dangerous products mm -hmm. and all that cyber bullying and all that so I think another supports from policies make policy makers should be a regulation that can curb all these harmful uh, usage of social media including cyber bullying is including a spread of means information not only from mental health issues but also re COVID related information uh, selling of um, dangerous products or dangerous healthcare supplements and all that so there must, be, there must be a policies that should be governed both under KKM and also from the MCMC. Mm -hmm. So that is a bigger role of support that I see. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely timely because now, especially during campaign season, there's going to be a lot of things on social media. So there's definitely need to be governance here, yes. a little bit of regulation here. Okay, we have discussed a few challenges here when it comes to healthcare policies and healthcare reforms. We'll be back to discuss more on solutions. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to It's About Youth. On today's topic, we'll be talking about healthcare. Just now we have talked about some of the challenges in healthcare. Now we're going to focus more on policies and also solutions, especially ahead of G15, where we want our candidates, our future policymakers to take note of. We have with us um, Sean from uh, Malaysian Health Coalition and also Amiro from Medical Mythbusters Malaysia. So now, Certain parties have announced their manifestos and certain uh, like BN, PH and also PN also, they have pledged um, certain things when it comes to healthcare policies, right? Um, 
well, one day would like to increase public health care expenditure, for example. So, and a lot more pledges focusing on health um, from many, many coalitions. So, I would like to know, what do you think, what do you make of this manifestos on health? And also, what do you think a key issue that you would like to put in a manifesto? Sean. Right, thank you. Well, number one, all parties have actually uh, pledged to increase uh, healthcare expenditure to 5% yeah. uh, of the, G the GDP. Uh, this is a good move because uh, most of our most most of the developed countries have actually uh, re reached that level, but Malaysia is currently only at two point six percent. So this is a good move, um, but of course uh, it is less about what you promise and more about what you actually implement. Uh, so what we want to see is actually the things that have will actually be implemented once the parties come into power. But well, one specific thing that which I would like to see is actually in terms of uh, managing our healthcare, uh, human resources in the in terms of healthcare. So um, we have got uh, over the past two years, we have got uh, you know, the country was sh shook by um, a series of uh, events uh, in terms of uh, we had the strike, work strike by doctors. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the, this is the one specific thing that I like to see because the human resources is the greatest asset for KKM, and if we are not <coughs> able to manage this well. Um, you know, we have got a lot of doctors, nurses, uh, trained professionals who are actually leaving the country for yeah. other countries. Yep. Yep. Uh, if, we, if we are not able to manage our human resources well, um, we are not able to provide the services that our rakyat need. So this is one that I would like to see whoever forms the government yep. focus on next. Okay, I'll definitely touch more on that. What about you, Emiro? What would you like to see? What do you think first? What do you think of the party's manifesto so far? If you have a chance to read them, and also what would you want to be in a party's manifesto when it comes to healthcare? Right. right. Um, I think what the various parties have touched is more on the macro side of it, which is mm. the general parts of it. But what I want them to focus on also is on how to manage the funds, even if they have. Uh, more funds coming in, more financing coming in, but how they are going to manage the monies. As we see right now, our healthcare expenditure is mostly like an inverted pyramid. Mm -hmm. We are forcing, focusing more on the tertiary care, which is the hospital, for example, cardiology, neurology. I'm not saying that those are not good, uh, not good um, subsidizing, but we need to focus more on the bottom part of the pyramid, which is the public health and also the primary care health services, yeah. because these two, focus every, every on the prevention and also focuses on the treatment of disease earlier on before it mm. becomes heart attack before it becomes a major disease so that costs more yes that's cure. why we need to invert back the pyramids focus more not only from the refinancing but also from the human resources put more resources in terms of public health and also primary care services so that we can prevent diseases from getting worse we can provide early treatment and we can even offer screening to detect disease early on so that is one thing that I want to see how the funding is being managed. That's good. We'll also get back to that. Um, before that, um, on the wider scale, obviously for this particular, before we abolish the government, the health ministry has announced that uh, the health white paper, which is uh, healthcare reforms that spans over 15 years to basically outline an overdue structural reform from the healthcare sector. Again, what do you hope to see here, Sean? Well, Varna, um, this health white paper is something that you know um, that many of the top uh, minds in terms of healthcare in Malaysia has put in hundreds and thousands of man hours on this. Um, but what I would like to see is actually uh, on three things: uh, on number one, charting the digitalization of our country's healthcare system. Yeah. Um, right now, many of our facilities are still using um, the pen and paper method. Yeah. Mm. Um, we are in the twenty first century. We are in the you know, century where we are talking about 5G, mm. we, are, we should be thinking about how we can digitalize things so that information can be uh, transmitted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as it goes back to the access problem yep. just now, True. right? Yes. Because digitalization would help yes. that. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing would be in terms of protecting our vulnerable. So our vulnerable meaning the uh, minority, um, our minority groups, uh, this includes migrants, include the, the old, the elderly, uh, also the young and, and many more. So um, a focus has to be going there because these are the groups which are not able to access and also receive uh, health care as they should they re require. And so the third thing is actually to review the health financing system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Yes. That's a because, big um, topic. Yeah, yeah because uh, you know, for us to seek health care in Malaysia, it's one ringgit 
if you see a doctor and five yes. ringgit you see a specialist. specialist yeah. mm. um, um, however, this is something that has been going on for the past few decades. Yeah. Um, healthcare cost is increasing. So perhaps it may be time for us to have a review of the system um, and, and what better place to do it than the what health white paper. Yeah. Right, true. Yeah. It's a health reform, right? Yeah. And may I add something yes. on that last point from Sean? I think we should also try not to neglect our private services mm. because during the pandemic we can yeah. see that most of them are affected a lot of gps are being closed down because they cannot get enough customers and revenues back because of the pandemic but now you see if let's say we have a mechanism to link both the government services and also the public uh, the the private services together maybe in terms of social insurance or something uh, sort of that we are not only giving customers to the uh, to the GPs for their sustainability, we are also increasing our primary health care because GP is a primary health services that can help our government counterpart. Mm. Not only that, we can also have specialists from the government side to help to maintain the optimum treatment being given by the GPs. Mm. So in a way, this is a win-win situation, not only to the GPs to flourish, also to the uh, people outside there, to the patients, so that they get optimized healthcare because there's somebody to govern the private uh, so services. That's a good point, Amiru. Mm. I think a strong public-private partnership yeah. is yes. required. So, yeah. so basically, more collaboration, yes. more partnership, more agencies that are involved to basically make healthcare more sustainable, right? And the one winning is actually the right gap. Mm. True. Mm. Mm. The okay. So, we've talked about increasing healthcare expansion now, and that's on everyone's manifesto, which is great. But... I'm sure more needs to be done to ensure that finance, financing healthcare services can be something that is sustainable, something that is resilient. So, to ins and again, it comes back to access, right? You need yeah. to be able, it needs to be sustainable and efficient for it to be accessible to everyone, yes. right? So, how do we achieve sustainable health financing? Amiro? Mm, again, I will reiterate my point, which is yeah. a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is number one. Number two, we need to educate our... Uh, people that insurance is something that is quite comp not to say compulsory but quite helpful in terms mm -hmm. of financing their own health yeah right so maybe more than that i don't know that's my opinion maybe what about you sean do you have any any ideas on how we can improve um finance um healthcare financing services well i mean i want to touch on this point when you mention about uh, insurance yeah uh, because um we, we do have got insurance, existing insurance, yeah. and but one group that is not being covered are people living in mental health conditions. Yeah. Because when people are okay. applying for insurances, you know, um, because they look at your medical history, and sometimes uh, the premium for people with certain conditions mm. may be slightly unaffordable. I so I think perhaps a, a review on this kind of, on this would mm. be very helpful in term because we want to make sure everybody gets to have you no. Know, yeah. um, enough insurance so that right, they right, can right. actually seek medical yeah. help when they and need someone need that it. will increase the awareness and also make them be more open yep. to get yeah. treatment because they are not stigmatized yeah, yeah and this closes the gap of inequality in, yes, in this yes, sort of yes. services as well yeah. right because yeah. you want to be able to get you know even those who can afford it be able to afford to get yes. social health yes. insurance for yes. example yes, true. Mm. okay now this is important for the both of you okay. which is what sean touched on just now which is you know lack of lack of manpower not being able to get the human resources that we need. We have a few issues already when it comes to um, MOs, HOs, um, bullying in, in healthcare sector. We've talked about Hartal, the contract last time. So healthcare professionals, how do we invest in them and their, and their well-being as well? Mm, again, I'm going to reiterate on my point, which is public-private partnership, because mm -hmm. we must not only focus on the public services, because we know that we have limited, with limited financing, we have limited postings mm -hmm. towards the uh, healthcare workers inside the government. But also, there are those who are outside are very good opening up their GPs. But when we are not helping them, mm -hmm. we are when we are not making them sustainable, we are actually making them go to waste. Mm -hmm. And again, for this inside the government sectors, we need to empower them, such as they are always willing to go further. They are willing to go from normal MOs to its specialization mm -hmm. and we must make sure that there are various platforms for them to further their studies not only the uh, normal master program but also the parallel pathway which I believe right now we are increasing in numbers as well. Okay. What about you Sean? How I do we invest in, in, in our doctors? We are the one who built this country up. Yeah, I think like what Amira mentioned, I think Amira likes to go from the external uh, 
point of view, I'm going going through internal the internal point of view. Inside, okay. um, so number one, career pathway, uh, as Maru has mentioned, uh, it's not just about training, uh, specialization or post basic for some of our uh, healthcare professionals. It's also in terms of providing them a um, secured um, employment. Uh, because because of the contract system that has been in place, a lot of our um, doctors, doctors uh, pharmacists, dentists hired on contract basis feel insecure because um, they are worried that you know, after the pandemic, would they still have a job? Mm. Um, providing them security in terms of their job, as, and as you mentioned, they have provided us quite a bit of service during the pandemic, uh, should, be, should be part of our agenda. And second thing is, uh, I'll go it from a very, uh, uh, I mean, I'll go it from the government doctor's point of view. Mm -hmm. It may be time to actually review the on-call allowances. <laughs> ah, that one is true. Yes, yes. Okay. Because um, uh, the last review was actually back in 2011, mm -hmm. and it's been 11, 12 years, mm -hmm. and and the, the the rates has still been the same since then. Again, inflation has risen. Has yeah. risen. Yeah. Um, Perhaps it's time to review. Yeah, gotcha. I have a doctor in the family as well, so right. I, I sort of understand this on call <laughs> issue a little yes. bit. So yes. okay, those are very good points, and also throughout the inter uh, throughout the discussion just now, we discussed challenges and we discussed solutions, and we hope we very much hope that our election candidates will hear all of this and will take note sure. of all this. I mean, it's high time that health becomes a major election issue, and our elected leaders should be held accountable to ensure that health and well-being of all Malaysians are protected because um, health outcomes are systemically also improved and inequalities are also addressed. So, this is It's About Youth and I'm Pahana Thank you for watching.